We certainly understand uh, now, though, that the moon is a very different place in different areas. Uh, you're just versus the experience of Apollo 12 and Apollo 14. Now, we're vast differences in the, in the terrain. Well, I don't think you need the exercise. Uh, you may as well extract it now. I don't need any more exercise. Huh? Of course, one, one of the difficult things here, I think, is to get a, uh, a map before you go uh, we had some of the best photography of our landing site, which had a resolution of about one meter. Now, uh, the photography they've been working from has a resolution of about two meters. And uh, I think that we could foresee some of the, the difficulties that they encountered. We could foresee this in a debate to start with. You know, the resolution of the photography we had was better. Now, uh, Apollo 15, uh, they, they have the, their landing site there, so, it, it, you know, if they get a big surprise when they get there with the terrain, you got to realize that they're working with a lot poorer photography of that particular landing site uh, than we did, and even uh, much poorer than what these guys have to work with before they went. Yes. Thank you, Pete. We'll be right back to you in just a moment. We want to pause uh, for just a moment. We'll have more on Apollo 14 right after this message. They're about an hour away now from uh, re-entering the uh, lunar module, and uh, that will complete the second and final EVA. We want to go back to our lunar uh, map here and bring in Pete Conrad once again, who's standing by in Houston. We'll pick up more of this air-to-ground conversation. Pete, feel free to comment as we go. I think this is about the time you'd like to be a lunar octopus and have eight hands. Yes. Shepard uh, will perform the uh, panoramic photography. get done with the pan. I guess it's still like the uh, FCSC sample uh, from the bottom of the trench, uh, even though it's probably at the bottom. Can we talk about adjusting our priorities here on Earth? They really have to make some decisions up there, don't they, with the time available to them? Yes, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, that that was a difficult decision not to continue onto the edge of Cone yes. Crater because uh, you certainly like to get to the end of of uh, where you plan to go. But after all, the, uh, almost all these timelines are, are so full in the hope that you can accomplish it. You, you can't look at this as, a, as a, uh, a lack of performance or something. Uh, you know yourself, Pete, that everybody takes more than they can do. <laughs> well, well, Frank, I think that's a real good point. In the flight test business, we always put 125% on the card. Uh, I, I really do feel, and I'm not uh, sticking the needle in anybody, but in the space business, with uh, everybody watching and not all as, as knowledgeable as the people that work at it every day, uh, sometimes if you have 125% in that type of card, they, they don't think that you got everything done. But the world's worst thing to do would be to be up there and run out of things to do. Yes. Pete, what was it that uh, you would like to have done up there while you were there, had you had more time? Well, uh, I think that uh, we would have liked to have uh, gone out in a different direction uh, from, the, from our vehicle. Where we landed, we were on what was called a Copernican ray, and uh, it was in a particular area where, where the, the ray, uh, we had several opportunities, say, to cross where they thought that ray actually uh, uh, ejected like is what I should say. Yes. But, uh, you can see it as a ray pattern in the photographs uh, of the moon. Uh, we would have liked to have gone in several different directions to ensure that we got material off of both. And, of course, again, something like this Rock 13 was turned out to be so different uh, than everything else. Perhaps we would have gotten more of those uh, type rocks and been able to pin down a contact uh, uh, here. 
But Pete, since you've refused to produce a, a Rock 13, I thought I'd update us a little bit here. We're three hours and 30 minutes into the second moonwalk. Uh, Shepard has just about finished the trench while uh, Ed Mitchell has finished the core experiment. They're, they, they've got about seven minutes of work more, of, of, of seven minutes of work more left here, we should say, at the North Triplet Crater, which is around 540 feet by our calculations from the Antares lunar module. When they get back to Antares, they're going to drop off of the Met and the samples and pictures they've gathered, and they have yet to return to this area west of Antares, out here, uh, to the where ALSIP, the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments package, is deployed to check the antenna and retune it, if you will, or repoint it to get a better signal back to Earth. So they've got at least an hour to an hour, 15 minutes more of hard work to do. And you can tune in. They're still picking up rocks and uh, samples at this North Triplet site before working their way back. into the trench again uh, in an effort to uh, acquire a sample uh, from the bottom. We're at uh, 135 hours, 22 minutes uh, ground elapsed time, 3 hours, uh, 33 minutes uh, since time of cabin depressurization. Our countdown clock shows uh, 56 minutes remaining on this second lunar excursion. About three and a half, five minutes uh, left at uh, triplet. And they've got to go all the way back out to the ALSIP site. Back up now. One more document sample. Okay, there is a special request. Uh, Robert Gregg samples at the uh, North uh, Crater Rim there. They'd like to get a documented sample of a partially buried rock. You're seeing now the real-time inputs of Houston as they start to uh, ask for specific items and specific rocks based upon the, uh, the experience to date. Pete, they're apparently able to bring back about two and a half times the, the weight of rocks you and Al Bean brought back on Apollo 12. That's right, Jules. Uh, again, like anything else, uh, the first couple of trips up from the moon, uh, we're, we're figuring theoretical values. We haven't had looks at real ascent engine burns, so forth. Uh, as I remember on our flight, we had some 700 feet per second remaining after shutoff, and uh, they have upped the payload capability, uh, and I think, uh, again, with another burn and a bigger payload, they'll take another look at the numbers, and, uh, uh, of course, they've um, improved the J mission LEM, too, so the, uh, the uh, LEMs after Apollo 14 have even a little more capability to bring back more material. 135 pounds of rocks, I think, was the final total uh, they'd worked out. How many pounds did you get back? Uh, we got back just under 80. Uh, also, if you remember, though, we had another two, 25 pounds or so of surveyor parts. The TV camera off the surveyor weighed 17 pounds. 
and uh, we had a couple of extra sample cans to bring back some of the uh, surveyor uh, parts in. And uh, I think all told that, I th as I remember it, our payload capability was like 110. And these rocks apparently will be at least as old, if not older, than the uh, the rock that didn't fit the pattern of all the rest, that rock 13 I've been kidding you about. Yeah, I, I think that really would be a very significant uh, find. You see, the rocks uh, from our flight and the rocks from Apollo 11 are, are different from one another, but they are cousins. Uh, and just like all of them are cousins to Earth rocks, so uh, this flight, if they found a rock that was similar to Rock 13, uh, that's really a, a, a big tie and uh, uh, would answer uh, many of these questions that we've brought up, really, just by going to the moon. It uh, would begin to tie things together a little bit. All right, thank you very much, Pete. We're going to pause for just a moment here, but uh, we'll continue with our coverage of the mission of Apollo 14. More on Apollo 14 after this word from Buffering. Space headquarters, less than an hour now before the astronauts have to return to the uh, LAM, that is according to the schedule laid out for them by uh, Houston. And they are very busy at this point, picking up rocks, photographing them, uh, obtaining more samples. Uh, I got the impression just a moment or so ago that they were, uh, they had a couple that they might have a little difficulty pushing down into the, uh, into the sample bag. Let's go back now to our lunar uh, relief yes, map. We have a large, uh, large rock that uh, Ed Mitchell was struggling with there, Frank, and uh, <coughs> she'll be glad that we missed the, that bit of air to ground. Everybody use it again. Okay, head for the limb. Head for the limb. And yeah, we're probably about 10 minutes away from the limb, Houston. Uh, Roger, Al. The lamb's got to look pretty good about now after oh, all this time so. working and climbing. Okay, and everything's on so far. And what you're looking at is not, of course, uh, the lunar surface. We have another picture uh, that is available to us, but it doesn't show us anything except an empty expanse. And the reason that we're staying with this map is because it helps to identify some of the uh, lunar television picture from the moon. The astronauts positioned the camera uh, before they left on this EVA. We might be able to see them coming back in. We will see them coming back, Frank, in about another minute or two. Could be. We're going to have to go a little bit to the north and go around it, I think. Yep. We're approaching just the from the Astronauts are making their way back now to the uh, LAM. We should be able to see them come in uh, before too long. We'll have more on Apollo 14 right after this message.
have seen it. The sight of our own planet coming up over a strange horizon in space. Earth rise. Now, two more men will see it. And with them, Tang, the orange-flavored instant breakfast drink with more vitamin C than orange juice. Nutritious Tang for spacemen and Earth families. Here we are now uh, back on our lunar relief map. You see here the model of the uh, LEM that we've uh, placed there.